I'm with Kevin Cable and we're here at St. Peter's Church here in Jaffa. Now, Kevin, when did you arrive into the Holy Land? Well, we arrived in May of this year during the recent uh, conflict and we stayed in Jerusalem for three months and the purpose of that was to get to know our uh, colleagues in the Diocese of Jerusalem and meet with Archbishop Hossam and also to concentrate and focus on intensive Hebrew learning which my wife and I did until we moved to Jaffa in September of this year. Now we're here outside St Peter's Church. Tell us about the church. What's the history of the church? So the church was closed in 1948 after the Arab-Israeli war and the Christian community here, many of them left the area. I think the hope was that they'd return uh, fairly quickly, but as we all know, things didn't work out quite like that. So the church has largely stood disused uh, since then. The diocese has gone to quite a lot of work to make sure that it is maintained as best they can, but our arrival here signifies the start of concentrated work to actually make repairs to the building, re-establish the Anglican presence here in Jaffa, and to work with the community here. Was this a very strong Christian community here in Jaffa before 1948? Yeah, it was a strong Christian community, and I think that's across the board in terms of the different Christian denominations. So, you know, we want to work in partnership with our Christian neighbours from the different denominations to really, you know, strengthen the presence of Christ here. Mm. And what sort of state of repair is the church in today? So there's a lot of work needs doing. We've had a pigeon infestation that's been here for some time because all the windows are broken. So the first stage is to clear all the grounds around the church to replace all the windows and remove all the pigeons. And then the first thing we'll do is work to the office so that that can be reopened and be a meeting point for those in the community who want to perhaps come and look at the church or or meet with myself here. So this is a completely empty building, just an abandoned building? Yeah, at the moment there's there's no one here. We do come up here pretty much every day just to uh, check things over and also it's good for the community to see us coming in and out so they know that we're here. Since you've been here, have you been able to establish a congregation? Yes, we have. We uh, worship in a local Christian guest house and we have a congregation. It's about 15 people when everyone comes and it's made up of some local diplomatic staff from the embassies, some local people and people who've found us online by looking at the website. So we meet every Saturday at five o'clock for a service of Holy Communion and it's hoped when the building reopens of course that then we'll relocate to here. Uh, Now in 1948 when there was the war, uh, did people leave quickly here? Yeah I'm told that people left quite quickly, obviously I I wasn't here then, but you know the the circumstances were changing rapidly and people had to make decisions but uh, you know the moving forward we we hope that we can uh, really re-establish this place to how it was before which was a, a thriving place of Christian worship at the heart of the community. What's been the biggest challenge of renovating this place? I think there's fundraising, first of all, because, you know, COVID has impacted people across the world, especially financially. So, um, you know, we've got to raise the funds for the repairs. Uh, And also there is such a lot of work that it's been about careful planning of where we start and what we focus on first. So now the grounds have been cleared, which was a huge challenge. Actually, the community can see that something's going on here. But it really, the next stage will be those windows and making sure they're done so we can get rid of the pigeons because of the damage they've caused. Which, you know, I know people here, oh, there's some birds in the church and think, well, that's not a lot of a, lot of a problem. But actually, it's a huge problem because of the, the damage that they do cause. So we need to get them out. You were telling me that you'd already put windows in. What happened there? So I understand there were some windows put in, but the pigeons found their way in again. There was also some vandalism. So this time they'll be putting in some extra strong glass that will stop that happening again. Mm. Have you found anything interesting while you've been cleaning up here? You know, what's really interesting for me is the floor, because uh, the floor, when you look at it, it it looks like it's concrete, Mm. and it's not. It's marble. It's polished marble. And if you take off that top layer of dust and uh, dirt that's accumulated over the years, you can see how beautiful this place was. Yeah. You've also got some of the original ironwork that went above the gate, a lovely cross, and just little things you find, prayer books, Bibles, uh, little inscriptions on, on parts of the church. You know, So the history is coming out as, as we kind of clear up uh, and find new things. When was this church originally built? I think it was built in 1922. And there was an Anglican community here before then, I'm told. And so really the church isn't that old in comparison to some of the churches here. But, you know, it's, it's certainly, I think, one of the uh, most beautiful Christian places of worship that 
that you will find in the Holy Land once it's restored. You know, it's a lovely design, it's a simple design, but it's very elegant as well. It's sad because it's not long after it was built, the war came and everybody fled. Yeah, absolutely, which is one of the reasons why I think there's a real sense of God's call to reopen this place and, and re-establish it for what it's for, which is to be a house of prayer, and worship, that uh, those who know Jesus can come and worship him and we as Christians can actually serve our neighbours around us. So we're, we're really keen to get going and restore this place to what it's here for. Uh, now, you're a Messianic Jew. Did you feel God calling you here to the Holy Land? Yeah, definitely. I, I'd felt uh, a strong sense of call to Israel probably for the last 20 years. Mm. But it was only in, in 2018 that, that that call really crystallised for myself and for my wife. And it was following a pilgrimage here in 2018 that we then made some inquiries with the Diocese of Jerusalem. Initially, just to talk about coming here for a sabbatical for three months. But as we talked and as we prayed, we discerned the call to here. And Archbishop Sir Hale, who was the former Archbishop, invited us out in uh, 2019 to meet, to talk about the opportunities here. And then after that, we went through a, a six-month process of discernment of the Church Mission Society who uh, help support us whilst we're here. So you know, it was a very carefully thought out and prayerful process of coming here. But yeah, definitely uh, that sense of uh, God calling us here, been there right from the beginning. Was it a challenge to come here and what did people think of you coming here to the Holy Land? I think in some senses people weren't, weren't surprised because they knew I had a passion for the Holy Land. Obviously they knew about my Jewish background and you know, I'd learned some Hebrew whilst in the synagogue and also over the years. And uh, you know, first century Christianity and, and the history of Christianity in that period is, is something I really enjoy looking at and studying. So people knew there was that sense of connection. You know, our children have grown up, they've all left home. So I don't think they were surprised this was the time because we couldn't have come when they were young. But I think, you know, they, they realise what a big project this is. And there was a sense of you're going in the middle of a COVID pandemic. And, you know, is for some, yeah, they, they asked a genuine question. Is this a wise time to go? But, but actually, although we had people who said that, we also had a lot of people that said, actually, there's kind of, you can see God working through this because, you know, there, there's a lot of obstacles, which means there's a lot of chance for him to demonstrate his power and glory. How long is this cleanup going to take? I guess it's maybe difficult to tell. And uh, How much is it going to cost? And are people from the UK giving money to help this project? Yeah, so donations are coming in from all across the world. The initial phase involves the clearing of the grounds, the windows, and doing the office. Uh, and that's estimated to cost $50,000, of which we've already got a substantial part of that. How long will it take? The main clearing has already been done. If you come here sort of six, seven, eight weeks ago, then it was a knee high in um, vegetation and, uh, and other things. That's all been cleared. We hope that we can get into the office, the clearing done and the windows done, certainly by end of the first half of next year. But obviously, you know, it's, it's difficult for everyone with COVID at the moment and restrictions. But that, that's the hope that we can get into the building and start using it in some form by the middle of next year. Are you hoping that volunteers will come from other countries to help after the COVID is finished and we can all get back to normal life again? Absolutely. And we've already had some of our supporting churches who sponsor our work out here, offer to form working parties. I think probably we'd have had some, some come out already if, if there weren't the travel restrictions. But we've got volunteers from the UK. I know some of the local community have also said they'd like to come and help. And our brothers and sisters in Christ here from the different Christian denominations have also offered to help. So once the, the situation with the current coronavirus uh, variation is more clear, we can get uh, looking to, to planning something where we can come together and really get to grips with, with the remaining stuff that needs to be removed from here. Is the church close to any biblical sites? So you've got the port of Jaffa, which is not far from here at all. In fact, probably I would say not even 10 minutes walk. Jaffa, of course, is the port where the cedars came from Lebanon for the building of Solomon's temple. You've also got Jonah, who tried to flee God's call to go to Nineveh. He tried to go to Tarshish from, from Jaffa, or Joppa, as it's referred to in the Bible. And Peter has his great vision, where he receives the, the instructions from God that the gospel is from all people. And he receives that vision whilst in Jaffa. So there's lots of biblical significance here. Uh, have you been able to travel around other parts of the country? And does that open up your Bible so much more when you're seeing these sites that the Bible is talking about? 
Absolutely. I, I think if anyone has the opportunity in the future, COVID permitting, to come to, to, to do a pilgrimage to Israel, uh, Palestine, it's, it's so worth doing because you get to picture in your mind and see, you know, the, the sites, the wilderness of Judea, you know, the, the Judean foothills, the Sea of Galilee and the area around there. We realise every day how, how blessed we are to be here when so many people would like to come and are unable. Mm. And so we try and do some video updates for friends, family and supporters of, of places so that they can share our time here. But I think my favourite place probably so far is Galilee. It's just so peaceful and quiet and so much of Jesus' ministry took place there that it's really worth coming to see. At the little congregation that you've established, is it local Arabs? Is it Arabs, Jews? Who is there? So of the local people at the moment, uh, most of them are expats who've been here for some time and from a whole range of Christian backgrounds. So though we are an Anglican church, I, you know, we've got Baptists, we've got Methodists, we've got a, a Lutheran with us at the moment who's in Jaffa for a short period of time. But um, I think one of the issues we have at the moment is because we're worshipping in a place which is not, it's not a church building, that uh, passers-by don't realise even though we've got signs and posters and things that, that we're in there. Whereas when this place opens, it's so prominent that actually we'll get that natural footfall from the local community to come in and, and hopefully join with us. Mm. Did you have a parish in the UK? And is there a big difference between pastoring a parish in the UK and pastoring a parish here? So I was the vicar of parish in Bournemouth, a place called Southbourne. I had two churches of very different traditions. One was Anglo-Catholic, one was more middle of the road in terms of their worship. Lovely people, very committed to the Lord. I think the biggest difference is in the UK, I had a team of people, you know, treasurers, people to staff the office, uh, preachers, teachers, readers, pastoral care people. Whereas here at the moment, because we've only just started, it's, it's really just my wife and myself. That You know, the Diocese of Jerusalem have been wonderful in their support. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just us at the moment. So I find myself being, you know, the, the maintenance man, the accountant, uh, the preacher, the teacher, the, the secretary. And it would be nice to, uh, to have some more people to help share the load. But, you know, we knew that before we came. And we knew that this was a long-time project. It's, it's a lot of hard work. And, yeah, there are days when I think fondly of my parish in the UK. And actually at this time of year when I would have been in schools and, you know, residential homes sharing the message about the Christmas story, to actually be here and, and more focused on the, on the renovations and, and building a community, it's lovely. But, yeah, you do miss it as well. Mm -hmm. What's your prayer for the future here of St Peter's? My prayer is that the Holy Spirit leads us forward as a community of Christians in this place to do his will. And, you know, success in the church, sadly, is often measured by numbers. But uh, I'm a big believer that if you look at the Gospels, Jesus started out with a whole, small handful of people. And from there, the church turned the world upside down. So I'm not concerned about numbers. I'm concerned about that we're doing what God wants us to do. We discern what it is in Jaffa that he wants us to do. Where is he already at work? And where does he want us to join in with that work? So that would be my prayer. And of course, that we can get more support for the work here. What's your website for people who maybe feel inspired and would love to come and be a volunteer at some point after COVID? So it's www.stpetersjaffa.com. Nice and easy to remember. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you.